Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining for our second edition of our Back to School webinar series, this time focused on our educational panel. Uh, I'm Josh Sevier. I'm an audiologist and the clinical program manager at the University of Chicago Medicine. And we have three of our Chicago educational experts in the field of deaf and hard of hearing with us tonight. So we're gonna go through and before we get started with the questions and discussion panel, just give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. So just going right across, if you wouldn't mind, Rollin, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Rollin Cooper. Uh, I'm the director of the Early Intervention Program at Child's Voice, and we have um, a, a program out in the suburbs in Wooddale, as well as a program uh, in the city of Chicago. And we do um, home-based services um, in speech and oral rehabilitation throughout the area. Uh, we do initial evaluations. We've got toddler groups. And then help families through the, the IEP process as they're transitioning from early intervention to preschool. And then we also have some speech services for kids over the age of three um, to come for weekly speech. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, moving right along, Molly, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, tell us a little about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Molly Berry. Um, you'll see Mary in parentheses. My legal name is Mary, but I go by Molly. Kind of something silly about myself. Mm -hmm. um, I am an educational audiologist currently with the Chicago Public School Systems. Um, I began my career as a clinical audiologist for about 15 years and then transitioned over, well, a brief in between. I worked for one of the hearing aid manufacturers in their technical support department, helping audiologists fit hearing aids and troubleshoot hearing aids and assistive listening technology um, devices. Then I moved over to the educational aspect of audiology, which I find is a nice segue for myself, a good broad spectrum of clinical versus educational. And I'm able within my own practice to kind of bridge that gap from what I used to not know between the two uh, sectors. So I am, like I said, I'm currently a CPS educational audiologist and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. And uh, moving right along, Colleen, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and tell us a little about what you do. Sure, sure. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Colleen Dunn, and I work for the Eisenhower Cooperative for Special Education, which is um, located in Crestwood, Illinois. And I'm a teacher. Uh, of deaf and hard of hearing in the Eisenhower Co-op. And I work with the pre-K students. Um, I've been a deaf educator working um, for 34 years. This, I'm going into my 35th year of teaching. And for 33 of those years, I've worked um, specifically with the pre-K students. So, um, I, you know, we help again, also transition parents from EI into um, our school setting into the classroom. Um, yeah, and our program, uh, our deaf and hard of hearing program at the Eisenhower Co-op, we service students from pre-K through high school. Um, we recently started a high school program there. We were uh, pre-K through eighth, but last year, we opened our high school program and we're building that um, at this time now too. Um, so yeah, that's uh, our program. We um, focus on language development. We have speech and language services for our students along with a variety of other services that we'll get, probably get into in a little bit. So um, yeah, so that's our program. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thanks for being here. Sure. And since you kind of mentioned it a little bit uh, already, would you mind telling us kind of what your day to day looks like and what some of those services that you provide to the kiddos that you see? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Um, as I said, at Eisenhower Co-op, we provide quality education. We use a total communication philosophy in our program. Uh, we provide an intensive language rich environment using combination of sign language, speech and listening. Um, in all of our classrooms from pre-K through the high school level. Um, all of our students also receive a variety of services throughout their school day. Um, all of our students receive speech language services. 
audiology services and social work services um, throughout their school year, usually on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, um, depending on their, you know, specific um, needs. And also qualifying students in our program can receive occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, and even vision services if they have any um, vision related issues. We also offer a variety of mainstream opportunities, typically starting in kindergarten. That would include mainstream into the regular education classrooms for um, specials, including gym, music, art, and also um, depending on the students and their own individual needs, they we also have opportunity for academic mainstreaming. So um, yeah, that's about, uh, I think I've included everything. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Um, what about you, Molly? What's your day to day in like the public school system and how that whole works and the services you provide to all the kids that you guys see? Sure. Um, well, at CPS, we know it's very, very, very busy. Um, we used to only have, when I started, we had about eight audiologists that covered the entire city. Um, within the last year or so, we are now almost doubled up to 15 audiologists, with, which is amazing. The city is broken up into networks. So each audiologist is assigned either a network or a network and an, a part of another network. They're very large areas. So we all have a pretty large um, student caseload. So each audiologist has a um, particular amount of schools, you know, in a designated area. Our job is to ensure that students, we say, have access auditorily to the curriculum or to instruction. So to make sure that, you know, if they have hearing aids or cochlear implants, are they working? Does the teacher, in the beginning of the year, we reach out to all the teachers and let them know, hey, you know, this little guy has a hearing loss. This is what you can do. Um, we pass out tips for teaching students with hearing loss to the um, classroom teachers. So we attend IEP meetings, 504 meetings. We write the audiology portions of that, those documents, um, the accommodations, the auditory accommodations. We work hand in hand with the teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, classroom teachers, other audiologists, um, what we do, um, hearing tests. If you know they're not able to get their outside providers, we have five audi um, audiology suites within the CPS school systems and they're all kind of scattered throughout the areas. So we do hearing tests, hearing aid checks, we change tubing, um, ensure they have batteries. A lot of the hearing aids now are switching over to rechargeable. So we wanna make sure the parents know, recharge those hearing aid batteries. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So basically troubleshooting, we get emails, texts, phone calls all day long letting us know, hey, so-and-so's hearing aid isn't working, can you come on over? So it's it's nice, we work, it's very collaborative and we all kind of work together as a team to make sure our little ones with hearing loss are definitely able to hear, at least while they're in school with us. Great, that's a lot going on. <laughs> there <laughs> is, there is, <laughs> well, I'm a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all gotta be, have to work in healthcare to some extent, you know? <laughs> awesome. Well, Rollin, what's it like on day to day working with uh, Child's Voice and the services you provide to the kiddos that you guys see? Yeah, sure. So my role is mainly administrative. So I do some direct services with doing um, initial or rehabilitation evaluations um, in the early intervention system so that kids can qualify for um, oral rehab services. Um, I try to really, uh, we get a lot of referrals from U Chicago or from Lurie's, and I try to really help families through the EI process. So, you know, helping them, um, you know, stay in touch with our service coordinator, maybe helping them, you know, find other providers that can help them with services um, and things of that nature. Um, then really helping families a lot through the transition process um, into preschool. That's fantastic. So I'm going to throw this next question out there. It's just kind of for all of y'all. Uh, yeah, y'all, sorry. Southern, mm -hmm. something new. Uh, when you first get a new uh, kiddo that you're working with, what kind of backgrounds or kind of information are you looking for before you get started working with them? That's kind of open for any of you. I know I would say for myself, usually when I'm talking to um, a family, I usually kind of just ask them some open-ended questions, like just to 
you know, ask them about what the what the history is to tell me a little bit about their child's hearing loss, how they were diagnosed. Um, and I just kind of um, follow their lead a little bit in what they feel comfortable um, talking about and telling me about. I always um, like to find out if the parents know what the cause of the hearing loss is. Um, sometimes that's really helpful for us, especially if the cause is something that could be a progressive loss so that we know you know, in therapy that we can really be monitoring their listening skills and monitoring to see if we start to see a difference um, and staying in really close contact with their with their audiologist. The, the other question that I think is really, really important for families is, you know, asking them, um, you know, what their goals are in terms of like communication. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different choices for kids with hearing loss and you know, it's important to help families sort of like realize their goals, whether it's um, to focus mainly on listening and spoken language or sign language or a combination therein, really helping them um, through that process and then finding, helping them find the right providers that can provide what they need and what they want. Fantastic. Any other thoughts or anything from any of our other guests? Go. Or Colleen, were you going to go? <laughs> oh, go right ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I'm actually pretty lucky because when we have the IEPs or 504s um, ahead of time, if we have that, it provides a lot of information for us. Um, not always audiology though. So talking, if the child has come from another provider, absolutely, you know, getting in contact with that other provider, finding out from the family who that provider is and do they know their provider. One of the the biggest things I find is making sure the parents know about the hearing loss and what it means to them and for their child and how they can, or what they can expect or what they can look for. And we know every child is very different. However, there are some things that we do notice are, you know, kind of common between children with hearing loss. And we kind of, I tend to point some of those out and say, this is why we follow them so closely. We want to keep an eye on this, keep them up, you know, with their typically hearing peers. And um, I, for me, information is knowledge and I enjoy kind of finding out as much as I possibly can, you know, family history, who has hearing loss, do you know anyone with hearing loss, do they have any friends with hearing loss, just to kind of make the family feel like they're not alone and this is going to be a process and this is the beginning of their education and we're here to support you and um, please absolutely reach out to me as the audiologist because I can help kind of bridge those gaps sometimes, or if not, find out who can. Fantastic. Okay, great. And um, I guess at the co-op that I work with, we, when we're getting new students in through the um, early childhood program, we like to get background information from the student's parents, of course, uh, from their early interventionists that they've been working with for the past, you know, few years, possibly, um, if they're getting services from any private SLPs or from their personal audiologist, we like to collect all of that information so that we have, you know, a good solid grasp of what's been happening with the student for the past few years. Um, Typically, our speech language path will be our um, biggest um, line of communication with the audiologist and SLPs that they've worked with in the past, just so that we have one person that's a contact person, you know, to connect with those, and then they will relay the information to the rest of the team. Um, we like to find out important information such as their recent audiograms and um, other audiological testing results. And we also like to receive information from the early interventionists regarding their students' um, present levels and their current speech and language goals so that we can build off of those. Um, we also think it's very important to discuss with the parents what they think are important goals for their child for the you know upcoming school year and even for their long-term goals for their child we always um, have a discussion about that too um, 
we, we have in the past, um, oh yeah, I think I meant that, <laughs> Never mind. Um, so yeah, basically um, that's the information that we like to collect from the parents and, and the other service providers. Fantastic. So I'm gonna throw all these questions out on us kind of whim, just kind of chime in as you would like. Um, leading on or following that, I feel like it's a great transition. Uh, the three of you all work with multiple providers, multiple teams across everything when you're taking care of all these kids. Uh, what challenges do you find working across different professions or trying to find out information when you're reaching out to different providers, when you're trying to collectively come up with a plan of care for the children that you're working and seeing? Yeah, I was going to say for, for us in early intervention, I feel like this is, is kind of a challenge because typically we don't all work, you know, for the same agency um, and we're off kind of all doing home-based services. Everyone's on a different schedule. So it can be kind of a challenge to, to be able to get together, but um, being able to collaborate is so important because for these young kids, a lot of times they have, they may have something more than a hearing loss going on. So it's so important for the if there's like a physical therapist and the speech pathologist to be working together because all these things are developing at the same time and are so you know interdependent on one another in in early intervention a lot of times you're allowed to do co-treats so you know that's always one good way to collaborate with another um, provider you can learn a lot about what their goals are for the child you can you know learn how to like carry over those pt goals into your session um, and then do the same for them so they can be carrying over some language and listening goals. Um, it's it's hard. It does take, I would say, some effort to to be able to track down all the, all, you know, all the other providers. So for us, a lot of times it's, you know, reaching out to the service coordinator, seeing if you can get the contact info from them. Um, sometimes, you know, just making sure the family has all of our contact info and asking them to pass that on um, to the other providers. I've always found that, you know, all the other providers are always really happy to co-treat and collaborate. It's, I think the challenge is finding finding the time to do so and finding the time to um, to get together. Definitely. Absolutely get busy, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would agree with everything that Rowan said there, you know, and then just I would add that sometimes another factor um, is um, obtaining the parent or the consent. Um, so we need to have consent from, you know, the co op. We need parent consent. And then quite often, the outside provider also needs consent before that communication can begin. So sometimes, you know, usually it happens eventually, but sometimes it can take a little bit of time before, you know, a few days to a week or two before that's all together. And then we can get started with the process. So. Definitely. I second that motion more than you know. <laughs> Those, uh, yes, the um, the consents in all, like you said, in all areas, especially with um, audiology services, it's HIPAA, and you can't just, you know, give documents. Even though the parents say, "I swear, you can have it," you you know, tell them to give it to you. And I said, "No, we need a copy." Um, fortunately, we have, you know, a lot of parents that will do it, but then some others will take literally months. And then I'm sitting at the table, trying, waiting for a, you know current audiogram and everyone's looking at me like did you, did you not do your job <laughs> it's like no I'm, I'm i've been waiting so yeah trying to track down um sometimes parents get numbers that are working getting them to call you back um, other providers i know are very busy then you know an option of some people don't have printers some people don't have scanners so trying to get the actual document signed um, but we do, we've actually met and worked with U of C and we have a really good system going between us where we know some clinicians can be um, territorial and it's, you know what I mean? They might think yeah. you're attacking them or trying to, but it's like, honestly, and we, we've discussed that, you know, in detail that it's really a great way to communicate and it, it's in the best interest of the kids. We're not critiquing your skills versus ours. We're all audiologists. So it's like, we're doing this 
hey, when did you see them? Where are they now? What are the plans? So it's that's a it's something we need to do. And I think we've actually been doing it quite a bit more, more so than we used to. So I really appreciate those lines of communication opening up. Absolutely. That consent. Yes, it's very it's vital. Fantastic <laughs> thing. Makes things run way more smoothly. That's for right? sure. Right? Yes. Well, you touched on a, a little bit on it, but uh, what kind of benefits there are in it, but what other benefits do you have of being able to share that information with other providers and work with other providers throughout the years? Yeah, one thing I was I was kind of thinking of that leads into this that Molly just said that I think is a really good point is sometimes, um, you know, as providers, even if it's like uh, providers of a similar discipline, if we're seeing kids in different contexts, a lot of times kids are totally different in different contexts. So, you know, I imagine like a child in a booth at a clinic, you're going to see probably different things in a school with their, you know, functional listening. So I think it's kind of like Molly said, it's like really important to be able to be open and sort of like listen to what kids are like in different settings. Sometimes kids are much different in like a classroom than they are an individual. And I think, you know, when we're open, we can really learn more about how that kid learns and, and functions in a variety of, of settings. And when we can learn that, that's really going to be helping the kids' education tremendously, you know, so the kids really benefit a lot from you know, the providers having some time to, to talk with one another. Right. I agree with that. And I also think that um, then staff, both, you know, in the school and the outside setting, they can work together to problem solve. They can brainstorm different ideas or say, well, this works here. Uh, maybe it would work for you, you know, just kind of shoot ideas off of each other and find maybe different and new ways to work with that student. Um, and really, it only benefits the student to have good communication and a good, you know, working relationship with the outside providers. Um, that's how we feel at our at our school. Um, you know, and also audiologists can provide a lot of support to our students and our teachers when, uh, you know, we're troubleshooting problems with hearing aids or cochlear implants. Um, you know, whenever we have issues, it, it's nice to have um, somebody who really has some expertise in that area for, you know, kind of struggling to figure out what the problem is. So we certainly appreciate that. Okay. So as the providers that see these kids on a day-to-day -day basis and work with them uh, regularly, what could parents or other caregivers do to help you reach the other providers that they see throughout the city or different states, that sort of thing? We're pretty close to Northwest Indiana, um, but just kind of individually with what you do, what could parents or caregivers do to help you out a little bit more with that whole process? I would say first and foremost, always, if you can, get a copy of the hearing test or hearing aid check or cochlear implant check reports. That way the parent has them with them. So whoever they um, are actually working with, whichever clinician, audiologist, teacher, um, agency, then we have a, a knowledge of their current hearing loss or their equipment or what they have because a lot of times we know things get lost and when's the last time you had a hearing test, it just gives us so much more information and we can get those little ones and big ones um, help as quickly as we can. I forgot to mention at CPS, we see pre-K all the way through the 22 year olds that are there until their first day of their 22nd birthday. So that's our whole age span. So we see the whole gamut. Um, but yeah, the copy of the test and also possibly a maybe a card of each provider that they see or a phone number or a name just to kind of keep a little packet of contacts so we're not um because you know lots of providers work at areas where there are a ton of providers and they well I don't remember who I saw and I mean we can always figure it out but it takes a lot of time so that's beneficial absolutely Yeah, I, I think also, you know, just making sure, again, going back to the consent, I think, you know, sometimes that's one of the biggest issues that we have. And so just making sure that that consent is 
in and everything's all taken care of. And also, you know, if there does happen to be a time where we're not able to um, get in touch with the service provider, then maybe the parent could make a phone call or something just to kind of get that ball rolling, you know, with whoever, whoever needs the the little push right there to say like, oh, hey, don't forget, you know, we need to get this, you make this connection and, um, and so I think that would help if parents could do that for us sometimes. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with all of that too. Sometimes it's easy as sometimes just to get the other contact information from the parents um, directly is, you know, a lot of times the easiest way. So that can be a big help. Yeah. Absolutely. We've talked about this communication between all the different providers and everything a little bit too. Uh, with you working with the parents, what do you find the most effective way of communicating between yourselves and the parents or from provider to provider, whether it be a private clinic, a hospital, or whatever school they're going to, what seems to work for you best to maintain those relationships and work through that communication? Yeah, gosh, I think that's a good question and super challenging. Um, I kind of find, you know, especially like nowadays, there's so many different options for communicating. Like, um, I would say probably most often text seems to work better than anything else. Um, but, you know, for some families, you know, sometimes it's like messaging through Facebook or messaging somehow through social media, you know, texting, emailing. Sometimes I try to figure out what it is that the parent prefers or what the parent is most apt to use or what's easiest for them. Um, I think I'm kind of like a, um, a big fan too, though, of doing as much either in person or on the phone as you can. I think sometimes, you know, sometimes it's hard in text. Sometimes things get misconstrued or you say something, but it you're, you're typing in something, but autocorrect writes something different. And, you know, you can't really come across things, you know, correctly with the right tone. So sometimes I think like doing stuff in person or over the phone is, is really good if you can. The other thing too, that I think, and it, it's kind of, Molly said something about it before that made me think of it, but, oh, I think that Molly was saying like um, asking the fan or telling the family a lot about their hearing loss to make sure they understand. And one of the things that I think is really important that's really nice that a teacher has or an early intervention provider has the, the opportunity to talk to parents frequently about the hearing loss. I found like in early intervention, a lot of times parents can only take in so much information at a time. So a lot of times after that first diagnosis, they understand a little bit, but you know maybe not a lot, or they might be still um, searching for other answers and things. So I, I find a lot of times it's like repeating information sort of over and over, maybe rephrasing it in different ways. And um, parents usually take things in um, over time, um, sometimes, you know, over years. So I think also that frequent communication is really important. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, good communication is, I think, the key between parents and school and the school and the outside providers for sure. Um, as our co-op, um, we've started using an app called ClassPad, and um, it's uh, we've had really good luck connecting with all of our parents on this. Um, it's an app that the parents can access through their phone, and we can send messages to the parents. We can send a group message to all the parents, or we can send private messages into each individual um, parent. And I like to use that because it's, you know, uh, everybody's used to having their phone with them. You can have notifications, so the notifications can pop up for the parents. And I like to use it. Um, I'll take pictures throughout the school day and you can post them so the parents can see what's happening at school, what their child's done at school. And, um, you know, they can talk about it when the students go home, like, oh, look, you were, you know, read this story at school or you were learning about letter A or whatever we were doing. You know, I try to, different things all day long and that way it's something that 
they have that's right there that they can share. And I do encourage my parents to do the same. They don't always, but if they send me pictures of things that they're doing at home, then I can incorporate that. And it, it really just facilitates a lot of good language for the student and provides good communication between, you know, teacher and home. Um, so that's what we use and have had really good success with. Um, and obviously, you know, we do our usual um, uh, parent-teacher conferences and those types of things too. Um, but we found that the class tag is really good for a nice day-to-day -day that's quick and easy and everybody really has access to. Awesome, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was going to say, it's great. I haven't heard of that either. I think, in, yeah, uh, you should check it out. It's, what's it called? I couldn't uh, Our understand parents it. really like it too. I'm, I'm sorry, it's called, we use one that's called Class Tag, but there's other ones. There's um, like Class Dojo, I think, yeah. is one we used in the past, but now mm -hmm. we've all moved so that we're all, our whole program is using the same one now. Okay. So we that's use nice. that one. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I know at CPS, we start with contacting parents, um, usually through the phone. Um, at the I, For me personally, I always ask the parents, what do you prefer, email, text, or phone? And then I kind of write that in the kids' chart, the kids, sorry, the students' chart, um, and then use their preferred method. I start with the phone. If that doesn't work, then I send an email. If that doesn't work, then I'll send a text. So I, I'm pretty persistent because we have to get that information just for the benefit of the student, but um, one of those electronic modes usually works. Unfortunately, we don't have much opportunity to meet our parents in person, you know, throughout our busy school days, because we are all over the city and not really in a particular classroom all of the time. So our best way, I think, is just through any mode we can. Fair enough. <laughs> it's kind of hard when you get a lot of students needing a lot of things all at once. <laughs> I know y'all are all there making sure that they have everything they can to succeed educationally, uh, classroom, whether it be mainstream or kind of some kind of specialized classroom throughout. Um, so functionally, every year you guys have meetings, uh, individualized education plans or family service plans, IEPs, IFSS, IFSP. So for a parent or a caregiver that has never attended one of those things before, it could be kind of intimidating to meet with everybody. Uh, what kind of advice would you guys have for them going into that for the first time? I would say ask uh, questions. <laughs> Sorry, Colleen, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Ask questions for no, sure. Go right ahead. Because <laughs> um, a lot of times, yeah. As providers, we throw a lot around a lot of terms that we are all very used to. Um, I have found myself in meetings kind of stopping other um, participants and say, oh, do you know, did you explain to mom or dad, you know, what that is? Because it's a term we use here at CPS and sometimes other places don't use it. Or if a parent has never been, like you said, to these meetings, they don't even know what to expect. Um, and try not to feel intimidated. I know it's a lot of people but we are all there with our own specialties, but we're all there for your child. So make sure you ask questions because someone in the group will make you, at least I hope most people feel welcome enough to ask those questions because it is your child and you are part of that team. Right, definitely. It can definitely be a very overwhelming experience for parents, especially their first um, year or two in. There are so many, you know, professionals around the table and then typically just one, maybe, maybe two parents, but um, so it can be very overwhelming for parents to be in that, that situation. Um, you know, there's teachers, there's administrators, there's SLPs, there's possibly OTs, PTs, social workers, so it can really start adding up once. Um, you know, you get everybody involved in your student, but I think I, you know, would agree with what Molly said that, you know, bring your questions and I think I really would like to make sure that um, all of the parents know that our school team is there 
to help you, to support you, to help and support your child. We're excited to meet them. We're excited to work with them. And we truly want to do everything we can to make school a happy and safe place for our students. We always want to do our best to make sure your child learns and achieves their goals. And, um, you know, I would advise parents, as Molly said, to bring all their questions and ask them all, um, you know, until, until you feel comfortable. And if you forget something, you forget to ask something or you think of something later, then you contact your teacher or your, you know, SLP or your administrator or whatever, and you can always follow up. So if you forget to ask a question, you can always come back and get that question answered. Um, we're always happy to answer any and all of your questions. And we really just, you know, want everything to be a good experience for everyone. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree too with everything they're saying. I, I think I, I find that for parents, you know, a lot of times one of the most stressful times, of course, is like the diagnosis of hearing loss and, um, you know, figuring that part out. But then I find in the early intervention process, the next most stressful part is transitioning from EI services to, to school. It's a really stressful process because parents are going from a system that they know really well to a system that's kind of unknown to them. Um, and I I'm thinking a lot of Andrea Marwa, and I know she'll be speaking at the next thing, and I'll talk about this a lot, but her um, her presentations are always really excellent. She, she talks a lot about just what everyone is saying, how important a parent's role is in the IEP, that there's all these experts around the table, and they're all experts in you know, their individual areas, and the parent has to remember they're the expert on their child, and you know what they have to say and, um, is, is super important. Um, also, I think, you know, it's important for, for us in EI too, to um, explain to parents sort of like the difference between EI and school. So kids qualify in EI for the, for the most part, if you have a hearing loss, for the most part, you would qualify automatically with the exception of some more mild hearing losses. Um, but in education, it doesn't work that same way. The kids need to have some kind of a, a delay or some kind of a need in order to qualify for services. So it's really helping making sure families understand, you know, understand that difference and, and go in into it with some realistic, you know, expectations. Um, and Andrea does a really nice job too of talking to parents about, um, you know, what kind of accommodations to ask for, what, you know, asking for things that are appropriate in a school setting. Um, but it's hard because the parents are used to an EI. It's very family oriented. It's taking place in their home. The parents are a really big part of it. And when they go to school, it really shifts to much more being student focused. You know, so it's a big, a big change. I can imagine. A little overwhelming sometimes for sure. And we talked about like during those IEP meetings or just your day to day work every, um, every day with the students. Um, there's a lot of, as you said, administrators, principals, SLPs, audiologists, a little bit of everybody. So kind of in your ideal world, if you had to do it however you want, what would you like that collaboration to look like between all of those people and all those groups? Is that a trick question? <laughs> just kidding. It doesn't have to be. No, I know, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> An ideal world would be that we're all on the same page and that we're all very open minded. And like Rollins said earlier, I really liked that if you, you know, just know we're all here and Colleen mentioned the same thing for your child. We are all working together for continuation of care. So if <laughs> ideal world would be everyone has the um, consent signed. So sign the consent while they're getting their hearing tested, you know, then take a copy of the hearing test with you to the school when you register, give the clerk a copy of the hearing test the, for, the, for the school setting, sorry guys, um, a copy to the clerk, then the that can be put in the child's file. So wherever that child goes and whatever school they go to, the audiologist that gets them first, that information will go from audiologist to audiologist. Then also providing usually on the audiograms, you can see who saw that child, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's who their audio, private outside audiologist is. But again, providing 
contact information for the specific agencies. Even Raul and I met you in one of our IEP meetings um, previously, and it was really nice to meet you because, you know, we say EI transition and I finally put a face to a name and then you kind of explain more of what you do. So even us as clinicians don't exactly know what everyone does. So it's nice to kind of meet people and just kind of keep everyone in a line of open communication. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question now that I just got done talking? Absolutely <laughs> killed it. <laughs> yeah, that was a hard, that's a, that's a really hard, it's a really hard question. I, I you know, I kind of, you know, think a, a lot of it is about um, relationship building, you know, even between like providers and, you know, between school settings, because I've really found like every, you know, every, any agency, every school, the people inv who are involved with the kids, just like Colleen was saying, love kids, love working with kids, want to, we all want to, you know, have kids be as successful as they can be, as happy as they can be. Um, so I know everybody always has, um, everybody's heart is in the right place. A lot of times we may not know each other and may not know each other's perspective. So, um, you know, being able to like build relationships and um, sort of like know everybody's perspective, where they're coming from. Um, it definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard question though. It's hard to find the time for everybody to do that. Everyone's busy and, um, and so forth. Right. Yeah, I agree. I just, you know, I just think keeping the lines of communication open um, and, you know, as Rollin said, getting to know people, that's important. If you develop a relationship, then you feel more comfortable maybe reaching out if there's an issue and, you know, just to keep everything open and, yeah, remember that we're all here for that one reason, which is the student. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. During those collaborations and that communication with everybody, do you ever feel like you run into instances where things don't work as well as they should or as work as well? And if there is anything like that, what kind of ways would you work to improve something like that in that situation? Yeah, well, I would say that maybe one, one issue I don't know if this is exactly what what your question is, but um, you know, I think sometimes we're better about reaching out when we're having an issue or a concern about a student, but then there's the students that, you know, are going along okay and we might not have that same communication with the outside providers. Um, with students that we don't really have any concerns with, but I think that it could be just as important, you know, to have communication with those about those students also. And, you know, if there was a way that we could maybe have like, uh, I mean, this is the ideal world, right? We could have a checklist for each student and time to collaborate about everybody that would be, you know, ideal but unfortunately everybody has a lot going on and you know your most pressing issues are the ones that probably get the most attention absolutely i definitely agree i think we can all kind of agree and we all need more time <laughs> <laughs> definitely right yeah, I, re I recently had an experience at an IEP meeting where I had sent, uh, one of our providers had done some standardized testing that that we were sharing um, with the district prior to the meeting. And I had sent it out to someone on the team, but I hadn't sent it to the other speech pathologist, which was who I really meant to send it to. Um, and so it was just kind of a lesson for me because you know, at the meeting, she wasn't aware of some of the um, delays that this particular student had. Um, you know, and, and it would have been much better for her to, her to have had that information uh, beforehand. So sometimes, just like you're saying, like just not having enough time or maybe not realizing that you've sent something to the wrong person, just making little mistakes like that, though, you know, sometimes make the meetings more tense than they need to be. Or, um, you know, in an ideal world, you can share all this information up front so everybody has like some thinking time before the meeting and um, you know, time to time to think about how best to collaborate. Absolutely. We wish we all had more time. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. 
time and more bandwidth for everything and projects. Mm -hmm. um, one final thing, we've I really appreciate you guys being here tonight and kind of walking through this whole little magical process that can be stre stressful and helpful to everyone going through it. Uh, do you have any other final advice or words of wisdom for family members or the kids themselves going through this educational process that you'd like to share? Um, I would think just, it seems like it's a bit of a theme here, but communication is key and, you know, just to make sure that if you ever start to feel, you know, that little question, like, what, what's going on? Why are we doing this? To just ask up front before it starts kind of festering and turns into a big deal. It's better to just talk about it right away and problem solve and get through any issues or questions you might have. And, um, you know, we all want it to be a smooth process and we all want to have good relationships with everybody that we're working with. And um, I really think that that's like the best way to do that. And I, I feel like that's really important for, for everyone involved. Yeah, I would say kind of like a couple of um, things that I think are important. I think we, we were talking about this a little bit before the webinar actually started, but I think we were talking about um, just how, how much another parent of a child with hearing loss or a person with hearing loss understands things at a much different level than a professional does. So I think helping families make these connections with, with other families, which I know you, got, you all were talking about um, a little bit before, but there's you know, Guide by Your Side is a great um, organization um, and they do a great job of, with early intervention, matching families um, with kids with hearing loss with other families with kids with hearing loss who are further along in the process to help them through. But I find a lot of times um, a parent understands something on a whole different level than I do. And it, it's really meaningful, I think, for parents to, to have that. I yeah, agree. I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. And I just recently, um, someone from Illinois, um, Hands and Voices, reached out to me again. I was going to say, in the past, I used to refer to them a lot, and then I don't know where I kind of, kind of forgot about that. I hate to say out loud, but you'll know, knowing me, I will tell you, I'm a very honest person and transparent. <laughs> um, so they did remind me to kind of remind families, hey, reach out to them. I have the link so I can share that if anyone would like. Um, but for parents and me as a clinician, I just ask to be honest with the team um, because we mm -hmm. cannot help your children if you're not, get, I'm not saying that you're not honest, but you know, I'll say, you know, do they wear their hearings? Oh yeah, they wear the hearing aids. And then you can clearly see they don't, wear, if they don't, that's okay. Let us know so we know where we're starting from and how we can help you to help your children to hear and get that full experience in the classroom. Absolutely. There are tons mm -hmm. of resources out there that are available for families and you wouldn't know if you don't ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely one thing to feel free to reach out with questions if you have them. If you need a mentor through that process, the fantastic panelists here or your audiologist, SLP, whoever you see, I'm sure we'll definitely be able to point you in that right direction. Um, we all definitely want the best for the kids and the students going through this process and make sure they have everything they need to succeed in life. Uh, with that, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to contact us and we'll be more than happy to get you a question to uh, the provider that you're looking for. Uh, but once again, I definitely want to thank our fantastic educational panelists for being here with us this evening. And I greatly appreciate everybody's time. You know, thank y'all seriously. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for coming. Gosh, out. I forgot one thing. Please make sure your, your children's devices are working. <laughs> yeah. That is the number one thing. First and foremost, make sure they're working. Batteries and charged. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. us here. Um, it was it was nice to be here and to have this conversation um, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wishing everybody a very happy 22-23 school year. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Here. Let it be somewhat normal, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.